Uh, like you said, my name is Jimmy. I get the honor uh, to be able to talk about Jesus tonight. And that's really what 412 is. It's an invitation to say, let's talk about Jesus. And we have so much fun at 412. I mean, we really do. It's a, we're trying to do church differently. We're trying to invite you out and say, look, we want to create an environment to where we're doing church differently. And tonight really is all about what does it look like to do church differently? Yeah, that's really what the idea is. And I just want to request from you, give me 25 minutes from your entire week to not, you know, talk to your neighbor, to not goof around or to, or to like be on your cell phone kind of ignoring or doing whatever. But just give me 25 minutes of your life. And, and, I, and I would love to talk to you about what Jesus wants for us as a church. To say, what does it look like for us to do church differently? Because I love 412 Student Ministry. Anybody else love 412 and the influence that it's having in your life? I do. It's like. It's just, it's such an incredible thing. How many of you have been to 412 for more than three or four years? Anybody been here for longer than three or four years? So you're with me, and you've seen this thing grow into what it is today. And, and I do believe that there are certain moments, along, uh, certain moments along the years that we've got to have these, like, intentional pivot moments where we remember why, how, and what this is all about. That it's more than just a social club. It's more than just a place to just another opportunity to have fun, but this is deep, meaningful, and we are currently living for an everlasting kingdom. Amen? Amen. Currently living for something that we're investing in for eternity. So tonight, I pray that you give me the next 25 minutes, and I'd love to. You're here, so I value you, I honor you, and I want to do my best to share with you the things that I've studied this week so that you could grow closer to God. Anybody with me? Anybody in tonight? Anybody want to grow? Awesome. Let's pray. God, thank you that you're here right now. Help us. We, we need your help to, uh, to help us focus, help us listen. So, God, speak to our hearts. Change our lives. God, we place ourselves into your hands. So mold us, shape us, make us. We want to learn what it means to, to do church differently here tonight. So if you love Jesus, say amen. Amen. Funny thing about me growing up is that I had an unhealthy obsession with Mountain Dew, okay? I, <laughs> Look, it was unhealthy to the point to where I was drinking so much Mountain Dew, people were like, that's not right, Jimmy. We need to have an intervention. We need to have a conversation. And uh, yeah, I just, for some reason, I had this unhealthy addiction to Mountain Dew. I loved it. If you go up in my office right now, anybody ever, you know, if you go up to my office, I have a Mountain Dew collection of all the different flavors of Mountain Dew up there. And people ask me why I do that because I stopped drinking Mountain Dew, uh, you know, uh, uh, religiously about three or four years ago. And I started drinking coffee instead. You know, just replaced one with the other. And, uh, and I'm like, why do you have all these Mountain Dews in your office? And it reminds me of my brothers because growing up, for some reason, my dad thought it was a good idea to say, hey, we will always have the fridge filled with Mountain Dew. Because his idea was, we want you and your friends to want to hang out at our house. And it was like the incentive to say, come here in a positive environment, then possibly go somewhere else. But it created an addiction in me, all this sort of stuff. I, I, it's, it, look, it got so real, y'all. Can I just be honest for a second? You know, my name's Jimmy, and I was addicted to Mountain Dew. Can I just be honest for a second? Here's how, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Here's how bad it got. Here's how bad it gets, right? There are certain kinds of Mountain Dew that I like and certain kinds of Mountain Dew that I don't like. My favorite type of Mountain Dew is Mountain Dew in a 12-ounce can of Mountain Dew. That's my favorite type of Mountain Dew, followed by a fountain Mountain Dew. If you get to a good fountain soda with good amount of ice, good amount of mixture, I could go a good fountain Mountain Dew. But you know what's silly? You know what's funny? If someone hands me a 20-ounce, like we used to call them quick slams back in the day, they kind of look like the size of this microphone. You guys know what I'm talking about? Someone hands me a 20-ounce of Mountain Dew, I won't drink it. It's disgusting. It's terrible. It doesn't even taste like Mountain Dew to me. That's how bad I was addicted to Mountain Dew. Is like I would love. I'm, I was like bougie when it came to Mountain Dew. It was like you give me the can, you give me the fountain soda, but don't give me that bougie 20 ounce. You know, that's just disgusting stuff. But dude, listen. Funny story about Baja Blast. I was there the first day that they opened it at Taco Bell. I was one of the first customers ever to drink Baja Blast. I promise, I'm old. And I was addicted, right? But I've been set free, right? I don't drink it anymore. That's what this is all about. Anybody know what the slogan for Mountain Dew is? Anybody know? Do the do, right? Do the do. Look at your neighbor and say, do the do. Do the do. Here's my theory. Here's my theory. If we as followers of Jesus 
focused on following the do's that are in Scripture, if we learned how to do the do's in Scripture and quit focused so much on following the don'ts in Scripture, I believe that it would change this world. I believe that if we focused as much on the do's in Scripture as we have a tendency to focus on the don'ts in Scripture, I believe it will change the world. So tonight is, what does it look like to do the do's? What does it look like to, to follow those commands in Scripture that say, this is what you should do because the don'ts are important. You know, don't murder. Like, that's a good thing to tell us, thank you, God. I don't want to go to jail for the rest of my life, right? Like, they protect you. They protect you from living in such a way that would destroy you. And we, we have such an easy time focusing on the don'ts. I want to focus on the do's. I'm not going to leave out the don'ts. Don't, don't get that twisted. But if we focused on the do's as much as we focus on the don'ts, I believe it would radically change us. Because it's in doing the do's that we begin to understand that I don't even want to do the don'ts. It's when we focus on what it means to do these things that God has asked us to do. And it's kind of one of those things like that we get to do these things. You know, I, I bet you I could walk around this room right now, um, and, and I'm not because it's kind of just off the cuff, off the top of my head right now. But I bet you I could walk around this room right now, and, I, and you could tell me a lot of the things that you know that you're not allowed to do. Well, I'm not supposed to get drunk. I'm not supposed to lust. I'm not supposed to have sex outside of marriage. I'm not supposed to. You can sit there and list all of these don'ts. I'm not supposed to lie, cheat, steal, murder. I'm not supposed to do all of these things. But if I were to switch that and say, well, now, I want you to start listing all of the do's in Scripture. What are those commands that God is saying, here's what I want you to do? Because the don'ts are there to protect you. The do's are there to give you life. And so many times we, we go to church, we think that God just wants us to stop living and stop doing these things. When God is saying, no, 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 I have a whole new way of living for you. This is what it means to live for the kingdom. And I want to start focusing on doing the do's. How can we do the do's? Let's focus on doing the do's, because I believe that it's in doing the do's that you will be transformed and you will no longer want to do the don'ts in Scripture. Many of us are, are stuck on the don'ts. You're not supposed to be lusting. You're not supposed to be selfish. You're not supposed to be lying. You're not supposed to be cheating. You're not supposed to be gossiping. And we're kind of stuck in that struggle. And I do believe that when you focus on the things that God has asked us to do, it'll give you life. Now, it's a theory, and I'd love for us to be that kind of church that focuses on these things differently, that type of church that is reckless in grace, that champions truth and is full of love. That we're reckless in saying, we're going to give you so much grace, we're going to champion the truth of Scripture, and we are going to be full of love while we do all this stuff. We're going to focus on the do. So let's kind of, tonight I really just want to read through some of those do's in Scripture where God asks us to do something, to live in such a way. I'm going to read a bunch of those scriptures, talk about them for a little bit, and I'm going to send you off to small groups after we sing a little bit. And I want you to talk in your small groups of what does it practically mean to, to follow through with these do's, to do the do's. So let's start. This is uh, Matthew chapter 6, where we get this whole idea of what it means to live for the kingdom. He says, our Father, he says, Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, I'm no English major, but done is a form of do, right? Done is a form of something that you want to do. You're saying, God, I want to do your will. So when you pray, you're saying, God, I want to do your will, meaning I want to live by design and not by default. Your will be done, meaning is saying, I want to live according to the way that you designed me to live, so your will be done. And when you live, your will be done, his kingdom comes. You know, another way for me to say that is when you choose Jesus, because every decision, every temptation is an opportunity to choose Jesus. It's not just, oh, I'm going to choose to sin or not sin. No, no, no. It's says, I am going to choose Jesus or I'm not going to choose Jesus. When you choose Jesus, you bring kingdom come. When you choose Jesus, throw that on the screen for me. When you choose Jesus, you bring kingdom come. What does that mean? What does kingdom come mean? That means change. That means living according to the ways of God. That means people are selfish, people are hating each other, people are gossiping, people are, are, are divisive and hurting, and, and, and it's just a negative environment so many times, I mean, in your school or your family or, the, or just culture in general. But kingdom, that's, that's the way God designed us to live. So when you do the do's, when you, when you allow God's will to be done, when you say, God, I choose Jesus, 
you bring kingdom come. You bring change. So little by little, when you follow God's will, when you say, I trust your design, you bring kingdom come. You bring change. You may not think that it's a big deal, but when you're at school and someone asks you to gossip and you don't and you speak life instead, you bring kingdom come. You change the atmosphere. You are doing something spiritual. You are doing something eternal. When, when, when you choose to love somebody, you're bringing kingdom come. You're doing something spiritual. You are changing the atmosphere. You are pointing people to God. And so when we do the do's, when we follow the commands of Scripture, we actually bring God's kingdom from heaven to earth. We are agents of God's message, God's lifestyle, God's life to our families, to our schools, to our friendships, to our church, and to our culture, to our city, to our world. And I love that because when you look at it that way, it's like, Again, we're not focusing on the don't so much of saying, well, I don't want to sin, so I'm either going to choose to not sin or sin, right? You're in that moment, what do I do, what do I do, right? Change it. Be like, am I going to choose Jesus or am I not going to choose Jesus? Am I going to choose something else or am I going to choose Jesus? And when you choose Jesus, when you choose to live by design, you bring kingdom come. You change the atmosphere. It's a spiritual moment. A seed is planting. God is doing something, and God will be faithful with your act of doing the do's. I love that. So when you choose Jesus, you bring kingdom come. Matthew chapter 7 and 12. What's the first do? The first do that we're going to focus on tonight is in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. So in everything, do to others what you would have others do to you. Very simple concept. Very simple concept. How many of you want to have a great friend who loves you, supports you, uh, challenges you, champions you, goes, goes through life with you? Anybody want a good friend? Anybody in here for real? Like, like for real, you want a good friend. Well, you know what this, this do is? Why don't you be the friend to them that you want them to be to you? Right? So when you do unto others what you would want them to do to you, all of us want good friends, so you be the friend to them that you want them to be to you. And when you do that, you do something spiritual. You do something eternal. You choose Jesus, and you bring kingdom come. How many of you, how many of you, want, to, uh, uh, how many of you want to have a family member that supports you, believes in you, a, how many of you want a just solid relationship with a brother, father, sister, mother? Anybody want just a solid relationship to be like, I love my parent. I love my sister. I, love my, I want a family member who supports me, believes in me, gives me a little grace when I don't take out the trash or do a great on my homework. You know what I mean? How many of you want just a good family member? Anybody want that? Anybody want to, be, to have a, a great family member? Well, why don't you be the family member to them that you want them to be to you? And you be the good brother. You be the good sister. You be, you be the good son. You be the good daughter. You be the good uncle. You be the good nephew. You be the, I don't know what, I know these are family things. Like You be the family member to them that you want them to be to you. And you, when you do that, you do something spiritual. You do something eternal. You choose Jesus and you bring kingdom come. You change the atmosphere of your family when you choose to do the do's. And you be the family member to them that you want them to to be to you. Anybody want to have a church that is so authentic, so full of integrity, so full of love and joy, that there's no clicks, and that everybody is loved and accepted? Anybody want to be a part of a church that champions God, lifts up the name of Jesus in a passionate, authentic way, gives you space and room to learn without being judged, to walk through your sin, to be reckless with grace, full of love and championing truth? Does anybody want to be a part of a church like that? Anybody want to be a part of a church like that? Well, church isn't a building. A church is a body, meaning a church is a people. So you be the church that you want to be a part of. You want people to come in here and take this seriously? You come in here and take this seriously. You want people to come in here and grow? 
You come in here, pull open your 412 journal, and say, I can't memorize all this stuff that Jimmy's saying. So if I just sit there and listen, there's no way I'm going to understand all this. I'm going to get me a 412 journal. I'm going to take just a few notes. So I walk away saying, do the do, right? If, I, if you just wrote that down, hopefully you'll get something out of this. If you want to be a place that you're not going to be judged for the way that you worship or the way that you talk or the way that you learn and you're searching and you're wrestling and you have questions about God, where a pastor can get off the stage and say, me too. I struggle with questions on God. Anybody here for that week? When, I, when, when God, I've just felt, I'm going to get off the stage and say, this is a me too church. I struggle, but I need Jesus. Well, that was me saying, well, I just want to be the pastor to you. I want to be the church to you that I want to be a part of. So when you do unto others, as you would have them do unto you, when you make those decisions, you do something spiritual. You do something eternal. You change the atmosphere. You allow God to use you to bring kingdom come. So what are the practical ways to do to others what you would have others do unto you? That's one of those things like, can we get good at doing that? Can we get good at living that way? How many people never want to come to 412 and like and show up and no one and say hi to them? And you feel alone and you feel, you feel discouraged because you're like, I don't want to go to church alone. Well, then you need to show up and say, I want to make sure that I do to them what they would do to me, what I would want them to do to me. So I'm going to be the one to make sure that no one's sitting alone in this room. I'm going to go outside of my friendship circle and include somebody else. Do unto others, you have others doing unto you. That's the first do, to, do the do, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. The second do the do that we're going to focus on comes from Colossians chapter 3. One of my favorite passages of scripture. I love this whole thing. It says, here's what you should do. You should put on then, as God's chosen ones, the holy and beloved. That's who you are in Christ. You are set apart. You are loved by God. So here's all the things that you get to do. And it just lists for like 11 to 12 verses all of this cool stuff that you get to do. And, I, and the best thing I could do tonight is just kind of glaze over top of this. But as I read through this, you know what I prayed for you? Is that I, as I tossed out a bunch of different darts of do's, that one of them would stick in your heart. That one of them would connect to you. And so as I just kind of go over a bunch of these things, it says you can have compassionate hearts, meaning you can be compassionate. You can not only see the hurt of others, but be moved to help them. That's what compassion is. Compassion sees the need of someone else and is moved to action for them. That's what you get to do. You get to see someone who's hurting. You get to see someone who's being marginalized. You get to see someone who's uh, going through something difficult. You can mourn with those that mourn. You can rejoice with those that rejoice. You can see them in their mess, and you can step into their mess. Not just, oh, I feel for you. But I feel for you, and I'm, I'm moved to action. So that's a do. You get to be compassionate. You get to be kind. You get to be known for someone who's speaking life. That What does it mean to be kind? It just means that I'm always going to be known for thinking of you and not thinking of myself. I get to be kind. So I get to do kindness all the time. I get to speak life. I get to just say, you know what I love? I love what you're wearing. I love what you're, what, how you're doing your hair tonight. I love what you did. I love the way that you said hi to me. I love it. And you just get to be kind. You just get to spread kindness. You get to speak life all around you. That's a do that you get to do. And when you do kindness and when you be compassionate, you do something eternal. You change the atmosphere. You allow God to bring kingdom come in your life. Humility. You get to walk in humility to say, you know what? I'm not going to think of myself all the time. I'm going to think of others first. Because humility is not thinking Less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So I'm going to think of others more. You get to walk in humility. You get to do that. What would it look like if all of us walked in humility and said, how do I think of others more than I think of myself? That goes back to doing unto others what you'd have others do unto you. You first need to understand the need that you need to meet. And walking in humility says, how can I be constantly thinking about other people, how to lift them up, how to be, uh, uh, be the friend to them that, they want, that I want them to be to me? You get to do that. You get to... Be meek and patient. I, I love these ideas. Meek is like you look for the good in people. Meekness is someone who doesn't get easily offended and is able to look for the good in other people. So when people come at you and they hurt you, you're just like, you know what? This is what I love about you. And like, wait a second. I just said nasty things to you. I just slandered you on Twitter. I just raked you through the coals. And you're like, yeah, that's cool. I know who I am in Christ. You don't define me. My father defines me. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of that definition. And you're going to begin to speak into them that they are loved and valued in the cross. And you are able to bring kingdom come. You're able to do something eternal. You're able to shift the atmosphere. You're able to literally do the do, literally bring kingdom come. Patience. How many of you need a good, do- I mean, I'm a, don't raise your hand, don't, don't, don't your neighbor. But, y'all, I could, do some, I could do some help on this patience stuff. Sometimes I'm like, y'all, what are you doing? Why are you doing it that way, you know? But patience, you get to be patient. You, you get to be patient. Again, I could do this all night because like, it continues in verse 13. You get to bear with one another. And if one of you has a complaint against another, you get to forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. So you get to do forgiveness. You get to say, you know what? I have been forgiven by my God, so I get to freely give out forgiveness. You want to know how crazy forgiveness is in the kingdom? They, Peter literally says, God, how many times should I forgive someone? Seven times? Now, y'all, forgiving someone seven times is a lot. Really think about this. Imagine if somebody lied to you seven times. Imagine if somebody hurt you seven times. How many times should you forgive them? Seven times? That sounds like a lot of times, right? It's like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Is that even the saying? Something like that. Uh, you know what Jesus says? 70 times seven times. Um, that's a big number. I don't even know what that is. 490. Anyway, but I did good. But you get to live a life of forgiveness. Why? Because when you realize how much you've been forgiven, you want to offer forgiveness to others. When you realize the depth of your own sin and how much God loves you and he died for you, you're like, I'll get, I'll, I get to forgive others. You know what's one of the most powerful things you could ever do? Is when someone hurts you and they deserve to be hurt in return, you forgive them instead. I promise you that is one of the most incredible ways to bring kingdom come, to do something eternal, to change the atmosphere, to do the do's in such a way that when someone hurts you and they are expecting you to fire right back at them because that is what they deserve, but you don't give them what they deserve. You give them grace and you say, you know what, I forgive you. And they're like, what, why? And you're like, well, because there's this dude named Jesus who forgave me. I'm telling you, it's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. So we get to do forgiveness. We get to live a life of forgiveness. It says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You know, we get to love. I'm going to get to that love here in a minute, so we're going to go past that. Uh, it says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, which, to which indeed you were called into one body. It says, and be thankful. You get to be thankful. When's the last time you thanked your parents? for providing the meal that you're eating at home? When's the last time you thanked someone for giving you a ride? When's the last time you thanked your pastor for standing on the stage and preaching every week? When's the last time you thanked somebody for something random? I'm not saying, no, I wonder where you come up and thank me. I'm just saying, live a life of thankfulness and be like, you know what? Thank you. And and I'll flip that back on you. When's the last time I said thank you for showing up every week? Thank you for for honoring me and listening to me as I study scripture and, and give it to you. Well, thank you. You get to be someone who just says thank you all the time. And so I, I, you get to do that. Uh, let's, let's move on. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You get to learn the scriptures. You aren't too stupid. You aren't too dumb to understand the Bible. You get to learn this thing. You get to not only learn the Bible, you don't, have to get, you don't only get to learn the word of God. You know what it says? You get to admonish one another. What's admonish mean? You just get to talk about it. You get to encourage each other. You get to say, you know what I read in my Bible today? You know what the Version app t- said today? Version app said today, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in love, life, space, and purity. I can't have But not only can you read the Bible, God believes in you, but you get to talk to people about it. Reading the Bible and telling people about Jesus is not something just for pastors because every minister, every member is a minister. We are all ambassadors for Jesus. Winter retreat, where are you at? Right? Again, I could just, I mean, singing psalms and hymns and, and spiritual songs. I love that because I love the worship at 412. Anybody else love the worship at 412, the songs that we sing? And just like the ability to lose yourself, to be able to just be like, I'm so lost in Jesus, I forget about myself, and I get to just get after it, and I just get to, just to get so lost in Jesus that I forget about myself. And we get to do this. And you get to meditate on the words, and you get to allow the words to motivate you to be like, this isn't about me, it's about Jesus. You get to worship, and you get to focus on God, and it rejuvenates you, revives you, renews you. You know what happens when you worship? 
not just sit there and not pay attention. There's plenty of forms of worship. But when you actually worship and you say, you know what, I'm so lost in Jesus, I forget about myself, and you say, I'm just going to give him the glory that's due his name, that song, that lyric is moving me, so I'm going to respond. You know what you do in that moment? You change the atmosphere. You, you choose Jesus. You bring kingdom come. And I, I love that we get to do this, and then it ends with this. It says, uh, verse 17. And then it just kind of says, and whatever you do, right, there's the do, whatever you do, in word or in deed, just do everything in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there's nothing in your life is meaningless. I, I, I feel like y'all didn't understand that. And whatever you do, do it for Jesus. You know what that means? That means nothing in your life is meaningless. Nothing in your life is meaningless. At every moment, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you choose Jesus and whatever you're doing, whenever you're on the soccer field, whenever you're at the dance recitals, whenever you're, wherever you're at in your sport, in your extracurricular activity, whether you're at home and you're at the supper table, whether you're uh, eating dinner or whether you're having breakfast, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And everything you do, the kingdom of heaven is near. When you choose Jesus, you can change the atmosphere. You can choose something eternal. He can do something through you that could change someone's life. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And this is how much God loves you and how much he believes in you. Matthew chapter 28. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit on May the 20th. Sign up on praisechurch.tv. That's in the scriptures. It just wasn't in this part teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So that's you. Don't ever get it twisted. I'm not the only one here that should be telling people about Jesus. That's something that we all get to do. And it's one of the greatest honors that God believes in me so much. He says, all authority in heaven is given to me. I now give it to you so that you can go and do and be a part of this great adventure, telling others about Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you ever come to a praise church baptism, it's not just the pastors who baptize. It's anybody who's leading someone to Christ. And if you've led someone to Christ, you get the honor of baptizing them. I pray that there's a day where we see a junior high girl or junior high boy baptizing somebody because they led them to Christ. Right? Because he says, I believe in you. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. You get to do this stuff. The question is, is, do you believe in yourself as much as God believes in you? Do you believe in yourself as much as I believe in you? Do you believe in yourself as much as this church believes in you? Your small group leader believes in you. Because God believes in you. I believe in you. Your small group leader believes in you. This is what you get to do. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip one scripture just to kind of wrap this up because I want you to talk about this in small groups. Go to Luke chapter 10. I love this story. We've read this before. You know, a lawyer comes up to Jesus. Lawyers are smart people trying to trick Jesus, right? So a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him. Now, notice the question is about eternity, right? What shall I do to go to heaven one day? And Jesus says to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answers, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So love God and love people. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Uh, this might become my sermon for next week because there's so much packed in that right there. He asks, how do I get to heaven? God says, here's how heaven comes to you. He says, do this and you will live. Not one day you will be off to heaven and, you're not, and until then get your heaven a free card and you're good to go. No, no, no. He says, listen, I'm bringing heaven to you. Kingdom come. You can change the atmosphere. You can invest in things that are eternal. You can be the seed in your family's life, your friend's life, that they may be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ where you can baptize them. Do this and you will live is not a promise for eternity only. It's also a promise for right here, right now. Southeast Texas, 412 student ministry, this room, this evening, this moment. If you choose to do the do's, you bring kingdom come. Change the atmosphere. God does something through you. I might just zero in on that for next week because that's good. 
Finally, I'm gonna end with this wise saying as the team takes the stage. So the team, uh, the worship team take the stage. We're gonna go into worship, uh, but I'm gonna end with this wise saying. Jesus has this really cool sermon, right? It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Anybody hear of this thing, right? It's a Sermon on the Mount, one of his most famous teachings as recorded for us in scriptural history by the, the different eyewitnesses that were there on that day 2,000 years ago. So this sermon actually happened. We have four eyewitness accounts of this sermon. How cool is this, right? He preaches this amazing sermon it's called the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in Matthew chapter 5. goes all five, all six, all seven. This, this really cool sermon. All these things that we get to do. And he finishes with this. He says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. When the storm comes, when the rain fell and the floods come and the winds blow and they beat on that house, the house is your life. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I've been the youth pastor of 412 Student Ministry for just over four and a half years now. I've been in ministry pastoring and teaching and admonishing others in all wisdom. I've been doing the dues for at least 12 years in this capacity. And here's the Here's the, the realest real that I could ever be. Many of you in this room will think that you follow Jesus, but you sit in here week after week hearing the word of God, but you're not doing the deuce, and you're building your house on sand. And when the storms come, like college, when the storms come, like university, when the storms come, like uh, a failed marriage, when your storms come, like like different experiences that you might walk through. Your house falls, and this is great as the fall of it. The, the, the reality of it is, just because you're sitting in this room does not mean that one day you will be with Jesus. Because you can't just come to church and hear. You've got to follow through and do. You've got to, you've got to respond. It's because of Jesus, right? That whole idea is that we live in response to the gospel, meaning we have to do something. But here's the promise, that if you hear these words and you're perfect and you never make a mistake, then you will have eternal life. No. You just hear these words and put them into action. You will build your house. You will build your life on the rock. And it will not fall. Because it's not necessarily about what you do. It's about why you do it and who you're building your house on. And it's the rock of Jesus Christ. He's already done everything necessary for your salvation. You just got to believe it, respond to it, and do it. And I love it. So that's why I love it's a wise saying. It's not just hearing, it's following through. It's doing. So can we get good at doing the do's? Can we get, get, can we get good? At, I can't talk. Can we get good at doing the do's? Stand with me. Let me pray for you. Even now, you have an opportunity. Even in this moment, you have the opportunity to do the do's. Because it says you get to sing spiritual songs. You get to, you get to uh, sing psalms and spiritual songs and, and lift up your voice to God. You get to do that. And when you do that, you're choosing Jesus over yourself. It's a simple thing, but it can be the beginning of a lifestyle of doing the do's. And so the response tonight is you have two opportunities tonight to follow through, to not just hear what I'm preaching, but to begin to do the hearing and doing, to do the do's. The first opportunity is through singing songs and responding to Jesus in worship. And I pray that tonight you grow in your experience of God as you worship and sing songs and lift up your voice to Jesus. That's the first opportunity to do the do's. The second opportunity to do the do's tonight is that you get to admonish one another in all wisdom. You get to sit in a circle and not just goof off, not just have your small group leader try to wrangle you up the entire time, 
But you get to admonish one another and say, you know what? What does it practically look like to do unto others what, what, they would, what I would want them to do unto me? What does it practically look like to walk through Colossians 3 and to put on compassion and kindness and meekness and speaking life and thankfulness and, and, and all this stuff? What does it look like to, to actually go and share the gospel and baptize somebody? So you have two opportunities tonight to do the do's. And I pray that as you begin hearing and doing, that, he be, that Jesus will transform your life. That he will begin to rid all of those ping pong balls out of your life, all of those things out of your life. He will begin to rid it out of you as you focus on and you fill yourself up with who God is. God, I pray that tonight you give us the strength and the courage to follow through, to not just be hearers, but doers of the word. And God, we're not doing to earn, we're doing in response. Because you've already done everything necessary for love and salvation. God, tonight we respond by doing because we love you. God, I pray that you give us the courage to focus on you, to get so lost in you that we forget about ourselves while we sing songs. And then I also pray that when we go to small groups that we have the courage to admonish one another, to talk to each other about this wisdom tonight, about what it means to do the do's. And God, most of all, I pray that this is a ministry that does church differently, that we are so focused on doing the do's, that we are so focused on having reckless grace, championing truth, and full of love. God, God, that God, this city is transformed by your son, Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus, say amen. Amen. Let's do the do.